item number three, and that is to hear and approve the following me minute, meeting minutes of December 3rd, 2019, February 5th, 2020, and July 7th of 2020. Um, the December 3rd meeting, um, I think we wanted to make a few changes because they just didn't read right. Um, so I will make a motion to edit the first um, paragraph under number two to read as follows. Um, Ms. Saxel discovered an adjustment was needed for the library endowment fund um, and just end it right there. And then Mr. Sensifani said that was the only difference from the add-in draft of the prior year audit. Um, do I have a second to my motion? Sure, um, Lori seconds it. Um, and then the, there's another change for the next paragraph. Um, it, it's the bottom two, um, two lines. I was going to strike the sentence that doesn't really make too much sense that begins the RS2. And we're going to just take that line out. And, it's then, and then the next line will read, a discussion was led on the proposed removal of the schedule from the audit report period. Um, and I'm going to make the motion to make that adjustment. Can I have a second? Lori seconds it. Okay. Um, so can I have a, um, a motion to approve those two uh, um, adjustments as amended? I'll make the motion. Can I have a second? Lori seconds it. And now we'll take a, um, a motion to approve the meet meeting minutes of December 3rd, 2019. All in favor? Um, that's unanimous, 3-0. And we will move on to the February minutes. Um, the minutes of the February 5th were held over because we wanted to make one change. And that was, um, in, again, in item number two, um, um, when we elected officers, we elected Lori as vice chair and Ed Bateson as secretary. And so I just want to reverse those two names in the paragraph under number two. And so it will read as follows. Mr. Bateson, motion to elect Mary LeClaire as chair. Lori Salton as vice chair and Ed Bates as secretary of the Board of Finance Audit Subcommittee. Uh, do I have a second to my motion? Lori Charlton. Um, okay, and all in favor of the amendment? At, um, okay, Lori and I approve the amendment. Um, all in favor of, of approving the minutes? for February 5th, 2020. All right, so Lori and I approve those minutes. Um, and Jim, do you abstain? I abstain. Okay. All right, and then we have one more set of minutes, the minutes for July 7th, 2020. Are there any questions on the minutes? Uh, Okay, so let's approve them. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes for July 7th, 2020? Okay, that's unanimous, three, three zero. And we can move on to item number four. Um, item number four is to hear and discuss an update report of the status of work completed on the annual audit for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2020 by Mr. Joseph Sensapani. Um, I'm going to skip all the titles of PKF O'Connor Davies LLP. Um, welcome, Joe. Um, everyone should have received an email today with um, 
a little agenda from Joe on the discussion he'll lead us through on update of the annual audit. Um, Joe, would you like to take it from here? Sure. So just a, one of the documents I said in addition to the agenda is the uh, preliminary communication of responsibilities. So that's the one that, that talks about our responsibilities under generally accepted auditing standards, generally government auditing standards and the uniform guidance and state single audit act. So just basically letters are saying based upon the engagement letter, we're going to do an audit of the financial statements. We're also going to do nothing to audit uh, of the, the federal monies, uniform guidance, and, and, and another audit of the state single audit monies as required by the state single audit act. So the timing of, of the audit is we, then we'll talk about the preliminary work that's been done. We've done some, some, some testing, but big, as far as final audit work goes, which we'll mention again, where you expect to, to begin that during October and, and to issue a report during December. And the, and the target, as we'll talk about, is uh, for a draft would be for the December audit committee meeting. The second uh, letter is, I think we've done this kind of as part of the meeting, but we're kind of expanding it to the full board of finance is, is our, what we call our fraud inquiry. So basically, uh, we're asking that this be forward to each member of the board of finance if they feel like there's something they want to communicate back uh, by responding to these questions. If they're aware of fraud, we suspect anything, uh, any communications from employees or regulators or anyone else. Um, and then send that kind of back, uh, send that back to me. So we're, the way this is set up and this is basically if you don't have anything to, to report back, you wouldn't necessarily send it back to me. If you do, then uh, you can send it back. And then again, this is part of our fraud risk assessment. So if any anything, uh, any concerns that come that were brought to your attention or that you have, that way we can incorporate the, incorporate that into the audit plan and into our risk assessment and into our audit testing. Um, as far as the, then the status of the 2020 audit, uh, we've done the majority of our, we call our preliminary testing, which is mostly just transaction type work. So looking expenditures and payroll and, and, and doing all our planning procedures. We've been out uh, to town hall, met with management and walked through our, our, our planning, did our fraud interviews, those type of things. Uh, so, so those procedures have been performed. We've uh, done an initial evaluation of federal and state single water programs and, and done some testing based upon uh, the monies that the, the town has received and, and, and looking at the requirements of both federal and state. Uh, we also done, have done a lot of the work for tax collector. Uh, so the procedures that we do at, on the June 30 receivable and that type of thing have been Completed. So impact, we'll say, of the public works findings on the audit approach. You know, I, I think the biggest impact is when we're doing the transaction testing. We're looking at bidding a little bit more closely, and, and, and not usually we more focus on the, the bid level, but we're expanding that to to also look at um, you know the quote level based upon the current policy. Um, Outside of that, that's kind of the, the, probably the major change is staff are, are aware of uh, some of the other recommendations, but since that's a, they haven't been implemented yet as of June 30, um, I'd say that's the biggest impact. So based upon then discussion with management, uh, get the Caitlin as far as timing, we're on a similar schedule at this point to prior years, looking that we would get a draft of the financial statements around October 15th. And then we would aim to have a draft of the audit by 12-1 or by, by the meeting. Ideally, we would get it to, of course, uh, a, couple, a couple days before the meeting, so you have time to look at it prior to prior to that meeting. Okay. So, so uh, as far as you know, we're on schedule, and I don't 
at, at some point Kayla can comment what where her schedule is, but we're, we are in, in contact along the way as things comes up uh, because there's a lot, obviously a lot going on between COVID-19 and FEMA and CARES Act and that type of thing. And, and you know, there are a lot of areas we'll talk about the Gatsby Technical Bulletin 2020 is basically saying as far as revenue getting recorded for those type of things. Uh, really need something official from FEMA, from OPM. And right now, uh, FEMA is is way behind in, in approving anything. They're, from what I hear around the state, they're pretty good at disapproving things, but they're not uh, approving things at a level saying, Here, here's what you're eligible for based upon your submission. Um, Part of the planning, and again, in addition to fraud, uh, we always have to ask the board if there's the audit committee if there's any any specific areas of concern that the, the audit committee has or finance, or, you know, outside the public works area that you know, related to the audit. If there was something uh, that we can build into the audit plan, uh, we could talk about that. So, um, so again, I mentioned Gatsby Technical Bulletin. That's that's a, that will affect. Revenue recognition. Uh, hopefully, we'll, FEMA will will do some get some information out, and and we'll be able to to, to see see where where reimbursements may fall for there. Gasb 84 was supposed to be effective this year for fiduciary funds. It, it kind of changes a little bit of reporting and changes uh, what pension plans may get pulled in. So 457 plans have not been reported, but if, uh, under certain criteria, they may need to be put back into the financial statements. So we'll be requesting that information and evaluating it, but it was the GASB 95 postponed everything by one year. So everything that was effective uh, that had an implementation date was postponed. So GASB 87, which I think we talked about at, at the presentation, so that's Leases that will have the impact of uh, there's only one type of lease. It's filed in the private sector guidance where everything is a right to use, an asset, a liability, what, what you have to pay, present value to, to, to use that asset. So that will change some disclosures. It'll change some of uh, what gets reported on the balance sheet. So copiers right now are more operating leases. That's probably the biggest one in most towns. It does include leasing property, but I think we've talked about it before. I don't think the town is leasing property. And then one that's a little bit farther down the road is subscription-based IT arrangements. We has, we has a statement on that, so Munis is kind of an example of that. So that, again, is going to generate, uh, it may not for you because you already have purchased it, but going forward, if, if, if you're doing any subscription-based IT, it's again going to generate an asset and a liability IT. So as far as COVID-19 impact on the audit, as far as risk assessments, it does uh, impact the way we look at certain things such as cutoff uh, and, and that type of thing, just look, looking at what's what's coming in 21, how that may influence accounting uh, or entries that are made at June 20, so that that is something that's uh, on our radar for, for testing. Internal controls as part of the planning process. We ask all our clients, you know, during COVID, you know, whether we're in or not, were there any changes in the internal controls, say for approvals, whether it be invoices or payroll or timesheets, if there was something that was significantly different. Uh, I think based upon our discussion, that there wasn't anything that was significantly different because people were coming in, so it may be slightly delayed, but as far as internal controls, from a big picture standpoint, it really didn't impact them in any significant way. And then we're, as far as our remote auditing, we're, we're, we're kind of probably doing you know, a combination. So we have been on sites and done some of the work, such as the planning and some of the tax work. Uh, we're doing as much remote as, as we can with some of the other things, such as invoices and, and that type of thing. So we're basically, Client by client, take the lead, let the town take the lead as far as, you know, when we can be on site or if we can be on site. And there are probably very small items, uh, amount of items that we have to be on site for, such as looking at payroll or certain type of uh, pay rates or confidential information. But you know, we have the secure portal and, and we 
use that as much as we can to kind of um, reduce the, the amount of time we are on site and so we don't have to do that anymore. So that's an overview of kind of the status of where we are. So we're, we're kind of in the holding pattern and we're getting, you know, still conference coming in and then waiting for the town to close and, and then again aiming to start final field work on 1015 or before. So we're happy to if there's any specific questions. Anyone has? Um, hi Joe. Um, yes, before I open it up to the rest of the committee, could I just confirm a couple of things? Um, one is with the fraud questionnaire, you want me as the committee chair and then Jim Brown as the Board of Finance chair to complete that and submit it, um, correct? Yeah, I, well, it's come up in a couple different clients, so I, I, it's, it's, uh, I'll leave the protocol exactly up to you, but I've had some other clients or other board members say they didn't get the opportunity, so it's kind of the approach I was trying to use this year is that maybe you email it out to everybody and anybody okay. who wants to read and copy me and then anyone who wants to fill it out and return it to me will then be able to do that. Okay, so in the past I've asked both the committee and the board to, to funnel all questions to me and then I would send it to you. And really in the past I haven't gotten any responses, but um, I can send the letter to everyone and have them forward it on to you if, if you'd like that. I think it went out with this agenda Yes, but I only went to the audit committee, I think, right? Yes, just the audit committee. Okay, and then two, on the internal, um, in number, section five, when you, what, we're going over the COVID ID um, 19 um, changes, the internal control. Have you already talked with the town about changes in the internal control and anything significant there or or you're that's still a work in process well as part of the the planning process we asked if it's covid and and, and working remote or, or working you know off-site some of the time impacted any of the the, the internal controls that existed say pre-covid and and the response was there was nothing significant because people did go into the office and improve invoices or, or, or certain things were approved electronically. So there was no significant impact of, of, of COVID on, on the, the financial internal controls. Okay. okay. Um, Jim and Lori, do you want to follow up? Do you have any other questions for Joe? Lori? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you. Mary, um, Joe, thanks again for being here. I, I have a couple of questions. I'm not uh, sure what order the men, but they're, you know, they're appropriate to go in, so I'll go in no particular order. One thing I'm interested in um, is materiality. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you determine materiality and, and what, what roughly your materiality is for the general funds? Um, yeah, well, yeah, materiality is, is, is using the, a firm thing is pretty close to what PPC, uh, the calculation. So we do materiality by opinion units, so because we're giving eight or nine opinions, so right. uh, materiality is calculated separately for each of those. And in, in most cases, we're using expenditures as a base because appropriations are the way government functions. So, when we get to the government-wide statements, we, we use the balance sheet as a base because the long-term assets and liabilities are are, are larger than the uh, the operating statement. So, so I find I mean I would have to to look that up specifically, but it's it's, it's a, for, for operating statement purposes. I I, I I blend my materiality a little bit. So you know, materiality is a like. You know, for government, the, the standard is five percent. Five percent. Okay. I, I use three. I'm a little bit more conservative when it comes to that. So three percent. So yeah, that's a pretty big number on your operating statements. Uh, 
but we're doing enough testing, we're not relying on that. And, but I would use that across the board. So I look at assets, 3% liabilities, 3%. So it's, I kind of break it down. I'm not using one number for the whole audit. I'm looking at the area, again, from a qualitative standpoint by uh, using that for each major uh, fund type, uh, account type, not, not just one number. Okay. So, so let me just make sure I understand that. So typically you're using expenditures as a base and you calculate materiality as a percentage of expenditures and three to 5% by fund. Right. Okay. By fund or by opinion unit really. Right. Because okay. a lot of funds get added together in some cases. Got it, got it. So I'm trying to, I, I don't know off the top of my head what, uh, general fund expenditures are roughly, but I just wanted to keep that in the back of my mind because I think sometimes there's a bit of a, a, a disconnect and, and not a, an appreciation for perhaps how high your materiality is when you're looking at a set of financial statements versus what we might think is significant for, uh, a, for transactions. Right, your, your, your budget's 300 million, so it's a pretty big number. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So that's helpful. My other, my second question is, um, you talked a little bit about your risk assessment process. Can you just provide more clarity on what specifically you've identified as significant risks, uh, including fraud risks for the town, if any? Yeah. I mean. Significant risks are, or, or, again, where, where cash is collected, it, it's never going to be a material risk. I mean, so property taxes is the biggest risk, so we spend the most time on that, revenue recognition, um, intergovernmental. Again, that, that, we don't rate that as higher risk, but usually that's the second highest revenue. Some of the departments or some of the funds, depending on how things fall, the charges for services, we may look at do some testing on that, so it's just you know, police outside services is a big number. So, so it depends on the revenue, and that may get that type of revenue testing may get rotated around. Uh, so we do spend, you know, because the standards say a lot of time on revenue recognition, even though the risk is a little bit different in government for for, for most areas. But we do uh, that. Risk assessment says that has to be at high risk. So when we're designing our audit procedures by following that that standard. Um, and and what about expenditures? And, and in particular, I noticed that you mentioned public works and the impact on your audit from on your financial statement audit from the DPW audit. How are you thinking about risks around? expenditures and our expenditures for any particular department, DPW or otherwise, treated any differently? Are you doing more work? Are you reducing your materiality? How do you think about that? Yeah, yeah that's more based upon samples of materiality is not be driving that, so it's more using what, what a control test is and, and, and looking at when we do transactions testing and payroll, it's more driven that way. So materiality doesn't factor in as much to to that. Again, the, the thing with public works that we, we did look at is, is to make sure that we were looking at, we'll say the quote limit, where we focus on the bid limit, because again, when we're looking at dollars, the quote limit's normally lower. So we did expand the scope of that task to, to make sure we were requesting quotes or anything that was in the 3,000 range. But yeah, again, we didn't really increase the amount of transaction testing. Uh, you know, that's kind of set. If, if the population works, if there's, there's a problem, then we would address it differently that way. But you know, I don't, I don't think we had any issues. I've reviewed that, that the planning worked out. Um, but knowing that there was something big, I, 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 would, I would be aware of it. I know we didn't complete the bid to quote testing yet. Uh, but we did, I think, we did look at all the invoices at this point. Okay, so you didn't, just to make sure I have that right, you didn't necessarily test more items, but the nature of the work you did was expanded to 
look at not just an invoice and make sure that, you know, if this is an expense, there's a matching invoice, cash went out the door, but you're also looking at whether those expenditures were in compliance with our quoting and bidding policies. Is that fair? Right. We don't have to look again at the bid level, but we added the quote level. I mean, as part of that test, you know, we're doing yeah. general funding. We are looking at account distribution because you're managing a budget, yeah, but that, that's, we'll say, standard testing in the government sector. Um, and then the other funds is a little bit different. Be some of it's driven by single audit. Some of it, you know, capital is just uh, have different requirements, but we do look at capital and other projects like budgets. Again, does this make sense to that project? So that's a, a normal attribute that we're testing. Uh, does it belong in the account uh, that I was charged to? Okay. And can you just, I know when you did your DPW audit, I, I don't remember the number specifically, but I think um, you tested maybe, I don't know, 300 or 350 items, roughly, and not trying to hold you to an exact number, but when you're testing expenditures, roughly how many items are you looking at during the course of the audit? During the course. Probably 100, 120, depending on how many federal and state programs there are, because that, again, drives a lot of our testing. Okay, that, that's fine. I just, so it, it's a less intense level of work than you did for the DPW audit, which was focused on testing those expenditures. Yeah. Right, because there was a compliance part that was, okay. for, for, for financials, we're doing a lower amount, yes. Okay. Um, thank you for that. I, let's see, what else did I have? I guess um, on, the, on the single audit, and, and I'm catching up a little bit here on, on this one, but can you just give a, a very brief overview on, on that? So how many programs get picked up? It's been a long time since I've, since I've looked at government audits, and I know the concept of the single audit was in test test, instead of testing every program, right, you pick a few programs. Um, that are the biggest or that follow whatever criteria, and then those are the ones you focus on. So can you just um, help me understand what what is the scope of the single audit look like and what programs are you focusing on in that work? Um, those that will, for single audit, they, they, they do the whole type A, type B program. So type A is 750,000, so that's a, a pretty high number. Uh, and so what this, what uniform guidance requires is we have to test 20% of all federal assistance. Um, we just start with your type A, and there could be a low risk type A, and you would have to substitute a high risk B type thing. So there, part of the single audit concept is not to test the same program every single year. So they want you to rotate through programs. So it's been tested, it can be evaluated as low risk, and you would test the B program that you hadn't tested previously. So there's a calculation. So every year is a little bit different. If you have a bridge pro program going on, you spent a million dollars on a bridge, that's going to change our testing. So it's an evaluation of what the town spent looking at type A's and type B's after two years and not testing it, a certain program were required to test. So there's, there's just a lot of rules that we have to go through to figure out what do we have to test this year. And then the minimum for a low risk audit E, no findings is 20% of the total. So that, that's the process. I don't have in front of me what programs we selected this year. Um, but usually there's one on the education side, IDA, Title I, because those programs are usually large. And then on the, the town side, it, it, if there is a program, it's usually a, a highway planning construction grant or the CDBG program. Normally, those expenditures are pretty close to 750 that we would test on, on the town side. But it, it changes based upon what happened during the year and how that moved to total versus us to be able to hit 20 percent. The state requires a uh, major program is 200,000 for the town. Um, so anything over 200,000 would be an A, and it can again high risk, low risk. The state single audit mirrors the federal. 
but we have to test 50% of the state money, the non-exempt state money. So like your ECS money is exempt. So again, similar calculation, have to hit 50%. So the process is testing internal controls, testing compliance, you know, looking at allowable costs, and then, then all the other criteria. Using the federal compliance supplement, the state has a similar document that for certain programs, here's what we want you to look at. This is you know, a lot less than the federal, but it'll tell us you need to look at reporting or you need to make sure. Uh, okay. Like, I, I, and I got, so it's, it's just, um, I was just trying to get a sense of how many programs you're touching when, when you do our thing a lot. Is it like five or six? Is it, you know, many more than that? And the federal side is probably lower. State side, I, I don't know if I can open up something quick. I, I was, okay, I was just thinking broadly. It's, it's not like you're auditing dozens of, of programs here. It's a few. Right, right. It's it's rare that it doesn't anywhere. I mean, ten programs and, and any client would be a lot. Got it. Okay, that's that's helpful. Um, I think. Uh, I think I'm just looking at my notes here. I think that was that. Just, just bear with me for a second. Oh, I guess the last thing was uh, this. So it sounds like DASB has deferred uh, all the new uh, statements except for the one on REVREC, and that's the one that applies to, uh, in our case, the FEMA reimbursements. Um, I'm, it's, I'm guessing that we don't expect that to be material this year. Am I wrong about that? In terms of what we'll actually recognize. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I don't know. The last time I asked, it was a half a million, maybe a little bit more than a half a million. So you're saying we would have had to have a commitment and and have something from FEMA that says you are giving this money, the checks on the way, et cetera, in order to recognize right. it. Okay. So that's what the technical bulletin and they just issued to address that specifically. Okay, so anything that's not in that state is not going to come into, is going to come into this next budget year, essentially. Correct. If we can't get something by November, you know, to say, here's the commitment, I mean, we can book this towards the end, but yeah, if there's not a piece of paper with a number on it, so then I don't know what the receivable should be or and or related rather. Okay, so just, so as long as you have something that commits to that commits to the town that we're entitled to money that was, um, I don't know the right word, earned or owed to us as of June, you know, reimbursement for stuff that happened through June, as long as you have that proof by the time you uh, are signing your opinion, we would be able to recognize that revenue. Correct. For the last year. Okay. All right. That was it. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Um, I'm going to take it to the other people, um, Caitlin, Tom, Chris. Do, does anyone else have any questions for what Joe presented to us? No? Uh, no, just to follow up on the, on the CARES Act um, amount, Lori, just to give you a feel, I think our submission was about $400,000 to give you a feel for the financial 20 impact. Got it. So four hundred thousand dollars is what we expect to have as a receivable. Um, yeah, within you know, I'm, I'm totally rounding, but yeah, it was right around there. We had a couple of non-cash. It was like about ten thousand dollars of a non-cash for maintenance for cars that didn't actually credit back an expense per se, but it's around four hundred. Yeah, we're going to talk about that as a quarterly. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Um, if it's okay with you, Joe, could you stay for the next item just in case there's any questions for you? Sure. Um, okay. So if it's okay with everyone, we will move on to item number um, five, which is to review, discuss, and discuss the Town of Fairfield, Connecticut Public Works Department review report on the results of the procedures performed. Um, I think Tom Bremer is going to lead us through a discussion on this. Yep. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I assume you can hear me pretty well because I certainly can hear you guys. Um, 
Okay, we have started our meetings house to address all the concerns that were raised in the uh, audit committee report. Uh, in, in reviewing over the, re the report, it struck me that we really need to set up two parallel tracks, and that's what we've been doing. On one, on one of the parallel tracks, uh, we have been operating to come up with a new purchasing policy. Uh, the purchasing policy that existed, uh, as you probably are aware, was um, at times ignored or at times sidestepped. And, and, and at the time it was written, I'm sure it was, you know, it was fine and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't really meet our needs today. So in order to address a number of the issues that were raised, uh, we felt it was essential that we redo the purchasing policy and review it and all that kind of stuff. So uh, following up a lot of Joe's uh, Senefani's comments um, that I heard in previous meetings uh, in front of the Board of Finance, and we've been listening in on all those meetings, uh, we took a look at a whole bunch of other towns, uh, specifically Westport, West Hartford, and Greenwich. We really looked at those three towns to try to come up with a uh, amalgamation, if you will, a blending of, of those uh, purchasing policies to meet the town of Fairfield's needs. Um, we've, we've met now for six weeks in a row. We meet every week. Mary's certainly been in a few of those meetings. Um, and basically where we are is uh, we are trying to come up with, we are coming up with a draft. Uh, I would say we're about two weeks away from a draft. Um, of blending the, the various towns together. And my plan is to, and again, this is just one of the parallel tracks, my plan is to, in about two weeks, have that draft. Uh, I have a working group of about 10 people. Obviously, DPW is there, purchasing is there, finance is there, uh, and a, a few other uh, departments. But anyway, uh, we hope to have a draft in two weeks. Uh, at that time, we're going to take the draft and review it amongst that working group, and give everybody a week to study it and make any comments that they have on it. Uh, we've also been called by the Board of Ed. They want to get involved. And so my thought was that after the working group uh, finishes the review, we then send it out to uh, the Board of Ed for their comments. Uh, I've had a number of conversations with Mr. DeWitt who I'd like to get involved in, a, in an early part of the process. So he can take a look at it as well, because my understanding is he was a, a prime architect of the previous purchasing uh, policy. And at the same time, I'm going to be opening up that draft to uh, all the other departments of the town, uh, because uh, one of the things that I think needs to be done is to uh, be able to take the position at the end of the day, regardless of whatever the purchasing policy is, I want to be able to take the position at the end of the day that every department's had a chance to look at it, every department's had a chance to uh, review it and make comments on it, and um, that will enable us to be much more effective in our ability to enforce that policy against all the different departments. So at the end of that process, after I have all the comments from DOE, Chris, and all the department heads. Uh, of course, the working group will, will review it one more time. And then that purchasing policy, I'm going to turn it over to the Board of Finance. And you all will, because I'm cognizant of what's in the town charter, you all, this is your policy, but we wanted to, I guess what I'm looking at it from a standpoint of the administration is to give you the best product we can so that you guys can take a look at it Draw out what you don't like, add what you need to, and we'll have a discussion and work out the final purchasing policy. So, so that's one track. The second track that we've been working on as a working group is we need to respond to all the different uh, recommendations that are in the um, audit. And what we've been doing as, as we've been meeting is at least at this stage, we're orally going through every single recommendation on a page-by-page on a -page basis to come up with what's the response. Now, the response is going to be one of many. It could be, we've done it already. Uh, the new purchasing policy will attend to it. Three, uh, we think this is a wonderful idea. We're, going to, we're about to adopt it, or we will adopt it by such, such a date. 
for uh, this is this, this is a workable for the following five reasons, so we don't think we should adopt it. Or five, uh, gee, we'd love to adopt it. We just need some more money to do it. We've looked at this different software, and you know these are the numbers, and we can have that discussion. So my my focus uh, with the working group at least is it's one thing for me to stand here and say, oh, yeah, we'll attend to this and we'll do that. But I don't think that's very uh, effective and I don't think that's what uh, would work. What I would be preferred to do is we're basically putting a book together and on each page of the book it's going to be recommendation 129, here it is, here's the problem, here's the recommendation, and here's the written response. And to the extent that the new purchasing policy will attend to it, we're going to we're going to list the page and the paragraph that we think addresses it, and I, I want to put everything in writing so that it's it would be it'll be very easy for the board of finance to follow uh, what all our what are, what the recommendations are as well as the responses from the town. So I'm very we're actually in my mind anyway I think we're a bit ahead of schedule. I really want to be in a position where we're able to have that discussion if need be when we turn over the purchasing policy to the Board of Finance. Um, and we'll be ready to discuss it then. I assume whether we, we, we can or if we need another week or whatever, we certainly will be able to do that. But the goal for the, for the working group is to have stuff uh, in writing, in booklet form, so that everyone on the Board of Finance can follow it. And then my plan, frankly, is to uh, make a presentation at that time where we basically go through the recommendations. Uh, I don't know how many there are. I'm sure there's more than 100. Where we can just go page by page and here's what we're doing and here's how we're addressing it. Um, now I'm sure you have you have thoughts and comments on how, how best to proceed, but uh, at least from my perspective, trying to get the working group focused in one uh, direction uh, I think that's probably the most effective direction that I've been able to come up with. Uh, it's certainly, I have to say that the group that we've assembled is working well together. It's moving very rapidly, and um, I'll be happy to take any questions. I, mean, I think I think we're on track. And uh, and I originally thought when I first started this in discussions with Brenda, I thought January was probably a good date, but I think uh, we're going to move that up a lot sooner than January. So I'm hopeful to be in a position to turn over uh, everything, uh, hopefully by the end of this month, um, at least to, so that you can take a look at it, maybe in the middle of October. That's in my, you know, give a week or two one way or the other. I think that's, that's what reality is. And I'm definitely feeling like uh, in terms of responding to the recommendations, uh, I definitely think by the end of this month uh, we'll be able to we'll be able to do that. So, if there are any questions, I assume there are. Fire away. Okay. Um, because Christopher Dewitt is charged with the purchasing policy, we will go to him because he has his hand up. Thank, thank you for having me in the committee meeting tonight. Um, I, I I like your approach, Tom. Um, one and I like the book thought. Each audit finding's got its own page. Um, the only thing I'd, I'd add to that is something that um, Ms. Charlton and I have been kicking around here for a little bit is that um, you know it's kind of a here's the answer, here's the resolution date, and here's the next time we're going to audit it, and then we're going to audit that every year afterwards. So for example, um, we need a credit card policy. And we're going to put it in place in January 1st. And then after six months, we're going to audit it, make sure it's working. And then every two years after that kind of thing, right? So I think that's, that's what will make that book, you know, have some lasting bite to it, right? Um, so what I'm hearing you say is you'd like to have a, a documented uh, follow-up, uh, an audit procedure so that we know if we say we're going to do something January 1st, December 1st, whatever, that somebody's checking six months later to see how effective that was. Right. Is that correct? That, that, 
that is correct. I'm, I'm trying to take the, oh, I didn't know I had to do an audit out of the, out of the, you know, conversation, right? Not that, not that, not, so, so not that Connie does that, but Connie's a very busy person, so. And with, with, the, with the purchasing policies, the only thing that, that I'd like to say is um, I, I like the fact that you want all this input. Um, but I have to say, you know, the final, the final word on this is going to be the, for, with the Board of Finance. So if, if on day one, whatever, that goes out to everybody, and we do a review as the purchasing policy committee. And there's a certain section in there that we're like, there's no way that we're ever getting rid of that. And the department head comes in and says, I want to get rid of it. Um, we win, right? We, we, we break the tie. So it's, I just want to go on record as saying it's a really good idea to get everyone's input. But sometimes not everyone's input is going to make it in policy because you know, policies are meant to be tough things and they're, and they're meant to, you know, guide department heads. And, and sometimes they're not easy. So, so as long as we understand that day one, everyone reviews, then we all put our reviews in, then the final review would come. I mean, I, I'd be happy to do the final review. I, I, I'd love Mr. Santafani to look at this thing at the end because he's, he looks at them, you know, all the time, I'm sure, right? And then, um, you know, certainly, you know, we'll go in with you, Tom, and and say, listen, the the policy committee, subcommittee of the Board of Finance recommends you you um, um, you know approve what what Mr. Bremer is going to present for in charge of the in front of the Board of Finance tonight. So I, I can make that pledge to you that we we want to go in there as as teammates, right? Right. No, absolutely. That. Look, I don't, you're preaching to the choir because, in my view, um, we're, my goal, and I think the working, group's, the working group's goal is to give you the best product we can. At the end of the day, um, if there's a clause in there that you guys are happy with and some department head is not, um, you know, I, my feeling is uh, too bad to the department head, uh, you know, at the bottom line. It's, it's too bad. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 I don't have a problem listening to arguments. I don't have a problem with all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the right. day, decisions have to be made. And, uh, and I, I do believe at the end of the day, it's your decision. So your decision governs. And, you know, you, you'll get plenty of support from the administration. I'm not worried about that. Yeah. And, and at least what I've been told, and, 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 and I, think, I think Mr. Brown would back me up, that's the way the charter interprets it as well, right? We we've got the final vote. I, on. Oh, I agree. With, I agree with that. Absolutely. So there's no argument. No argument. Yeah. So that's it for me. Listen, I you know I, I appreciate uh, seeing stuff as soon as possible. I, I know you want to you know put a shine on this thing a little bit, but um, you know um, Ms. Charlton is, is is offered to help me out because and, and she's. She's looked at a lot of policies in her life too. So uh, between the between the two, maybe get another person look at it before Joe looks at it. I, I think we're gonna walk out the door with a with a good piece of paper. So thank you for your briefing tonight. I think that's you. That's fine. Okay. Um, Lori, do you have a question for? Yes. Hi, Tom. Thank you for walking us through that. I have a couple of questions. Um, starting back at the beginning with the purchasing policy, I, I certainly appreciate the benchmarking um, and the fact that we pull that, that we're looking at examples from a couple of other towns. But at the same time, um, you know, I, I sit here and I say, who's to say that those are, you know, good policies or best practice? Right, you know, somebody could have done this exercise in the town of Westport and pulled Fairfield's policy, and you know, our policy has a bunch of holes in it. So, I guess, I guess, my question is, um, or maybe a concern about relying on 
on other towns' policies and, and how are we comfortable or, or what, what makes us believe that that's the right starting point to evaluate our own? Or are we using something in addition to that? Well, I, I guess, I guess the, short, the short answer from my perspective is you got to start somewhere. We've looked at, I don't know, seven or eight different towns. When you start looking at a number of what I learned, and you know, I'm no expert on purchasing policies, but my sense was, as I read through I don't know, seven or eight different towns, that a lot of them are very similar, if not the same. Um, they address the same issues in slightly different ways and that sort of thing. So uh, we also looked, there was a University of Arizona was one that we looked at. I mean, we haven't just looked at towns. Um, and I know that Gerald was looking at some uh, commission, I don't have a um, does anybody remember that? There was some commission uh, that he was looking at as well. Um, but you're absolutely right. There's no, there's no gold standard. I don't think there's a gold standard like this is it. If there was, I think if I read all the towns, they would all be following the gold standard. Um, so my sense was uh, they're all very similar. They they address their their uh, issues of slightly differently. And I thought that by uh, going through at least these three towns, because and why those three? It's because they seem to be um, the most effective in my mind that we're addressing the issues focusing on. But I thought if, if we don't get 100% of the issues, we're going to cover 95% of the issues. So uh, we had to start somewhere and that's where we started. Now if there's, if there's other uh, documents that we should be looking at, it's what I'll call seed documents, I'm happy to look at them. I just, I don't, I don't know where to go other than where we. Yeah, I mean, I guess you know we, um, you know, look, we're not necessarily um, we meaning the town, right? We're not necessarily ex expert in this. And again, I appreciate the benchmarking. I just the way I think about it is, you know, you try to understand what best practices are, and then you try to conform your policy to that. Um, a couple things. I, I hope that we're looking at the um, recommendations made in the audit report. If I recall correctly, there were 18 comments on the policy itself, not the compliance with the policy, but the policy itself. And I hope that we are incorporating those into the process. And also, I mean, um, I realize you guys are down the road, but I, I do think to the extent you get input up front versus at the end of the process, we're going to be better off and save everybody some time. Um, I think we've got Joe as a valuable resource here. Um, I think Joe is a person that can help connect us to, you know, best practices. Um, you know, we can look at this at the end, but, you know, again, again, there's always a risk there that if we're looking at something at the end and then we're providing comments, that means rework. And, you know, that's never ideal. It can be frustrating for everyone involved. So. What I would encourage as you go through this process is to reach out, um, you know, bounce ideas off uh, the committee, whether it's Chris and me or Joe, and, and try to get that input up front because I would not, um, you know, I would not assume that anything we're picking up from other towns is necessarily representative of, of a best practice. Um, you know, it may give us some ideas, but, um, you know, I, I would I would recommend making sure that we're incorporating the specific policy recommendation recommendations from the audit report, reaching out to Joe, reaching out to us as we move along. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be pretty. It's not like we, we have to get a completed product before we start participating. We're not trying to get in anybody's way. I just I just think it's uh, it's more efficient if we can try to incorporate those thoughts up front rather than then rework them on the end. So I, I would throw that out there. Um, I guess two other quick things. Um, one, I just I want to make sure that I understand. I, I, I completely understand that the, the two-track thing, right? Because the purchasing policy has a, a lot of components to it, and many of the issues that came out of the DPW audit were sort of purchasing policy related. And then we had a bunch of other stuff. And that other stuff was 
and I'm just verifying this, um, ancillary, I'll say, recommendations in the DPW audit report plus, uh, you know, recommendations from all the internal audit reports that have, that have been completed recently. So I just I want to make sure that we are, in fact, capturing the internal audit recommendations within this process. Well, to my, to my understanding, yes, we are, because what I saw in the, in the overall audit, it wasn't just DPW, there was a whole bunch of recommendations regarding our purchasing department itself. And that's, some of it has to do with the purchasing policy, but it has a lot to do with the purchasing department and how it operates. And there was even some recommendations regarding the finance department. So what I'm, what I'm, my plan is to respond to every recommendation. Okay, and I just I, I just want to be because one of the things um, that we've talked about a lot over the last I don't know six to nine months is what's happening with the internal audit recommendations. You know, Connie's done some good work. There was an audit on the credit card policy. There's been audits on other departments that have uncovered some some really basic deficiencies in terms of not reconciling cash that's being collected you know, to kind of what goes in the bank, you know, just, just some stuff that, I don't know how material it all was, but it sounded, um, you know, it sounded like stuff that needed to be uh, addressed. And I, I think what Connie told us was that, you know, she would leave these recommendations with department heads, but there had never been a formal process to follow up and make sure things got done. So, you know, I'm just, in the book, you know, and this is, you know, so the, the book that you're describing is, is sort of another version of, I think, the matrix that we asked for. You know, maybe it's a different format, but the idea there was to make sure that we're capturing all of these recommendations and not, not letting this internal audit stuff sort of, you know, go by the wayside or, or get forgotten. So if, if you could just make sure that that's captured in there, because there were some pretty important things in there, and, uh, and, and you know, a lot of good work. That, that we don't want to that we don't want to lose sight of. Well, that, I think I think I understand what you're saying. Um, I don't want to. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, and what I, what I'm hearing is that there were some other internal order recommendations that Connie's been working on that we don't want to leave on on the side of the road. Um, but to me, uh, and I agree with you, I don't want to leave them on the side of the road either something material, not even material, there's some things that need to be done. I think we should address those. Uh, but I think I should address those, uh, and I'm going to sit with Connie and, and go through all those because I don't want to sidetrack this group. This group is very focused on the DPW audit. And to the extent those, those internal audit recommendations that Connie's been working on affected or somehow relate to it, I'm all for including it. But to the extent that they don't, I would address, I'd rather address that separately in some other, you know, some other meeting that was at this audit subcommittee. I'd rather go and, and address that separately because I don't want to get, I've got a lot of people in the room that aren't involved in this. So let me talk to Connie. I'd be happy to get back to you at the next meeting and, and figure out a way to address those because you're absolutely right. I don't want to see those things put on, uh, put on the link. Put on okay. the side of the road. Either. Yeah. No, I, Tom, listen, I completely appreciate that. I think. Some of, their, some of them are on different topics. I just, you know, if you look at that DPW audit report, there was a priority of recommendations in there. Some super important, some less important would have less impact. There's some stuff in some of Connie's internal audit reports that in my view is high priority and more important than maybe some of those smaller items in the DPW report, right? So prioritizing the issues we have is, you know, is I think in my mind an exercise that we should go through. That was the idea behind getting everything on kind of one matrix or piece of paper. So, and, and in particular, some of those internal audit reports, you know, raised some troubling issues around cash collections and tracking of cash. So, I, I hear you. I don't, I don't, you know, want to you know, you don't want to distract people. You've got to keep the team focused, and I get that. But um, I don't think we should deprioritize that other stuff just because they're internal audit findings. We should prioritize based on the nature of the finding and how it, you know, how much risk it it 
presents to the town. You know, if, if there's an internal audit finding that could result in a bunch of cash walking away, you know, that may be more important than, you know, one of those ancillary, um, uh, you know, DPW findings, you know, outside the purchasing policy. So just that that's a piece I think we're all concerned about. And I know there was a, a little bit of, uh, you know, consternation, say, that, that we didn't, you know, to Chris's point before, you know, we we have this recommendation, now we want to re-audit of it. That wasn't happening at all with the internal audit recommendations. Um, the entire board wanted to see that happen, and I, I just don't want to lose that in this process. So, so that was that was my point. I'm not trying to comment on how you manage that, just that we make sure we don't lose sight of it. I have a second to put Yeah, I don't either, so that's, that's not a problem. Thank you. Um, I, I think that was it. Thank you, uh, Tom. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Um, just, just, just before Jim starts, um, to follow up on Lori's comments there, um, I haven't lost sight of the internal control report, and I view that kind of as a separate project for us. Um, that we want to see Connie go back and review that everything has been implemented as recommendation. But she is part of Tom's committee and attends all those meetings. So I think when she reviews the policy for the purchasing, she's at a no to make sure, check to make sure those items are included in the purchasing policy. Um, so I, I think she will handle that piece for us. Um, and with the internal controls, I, I do want to, at some point, we need to, this was our priority, so I kind of put that to the side for now, but I do want us to go back and look at those reports and discuss them further and follow up with Connie and that they've been, if everything's been implemented. Okay, Jim Brown, did you have some comments? Yes, thank you, Mary. Hey, Tom. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the presentation, and and I, I I agree. I think the process seems to be working for you. You've had six meetings. It sounds like you're well on your way, a little faster than you you originally thought. So, I just wanted to talk about timing a little bit. You said that there will be a draft in two weeks. Is that correct? A draft that is developed enough that uh, Chris DeWitt can take a look at it and the Board of Ed? I'm not sure if two weeks. It's either going to be, I think in two weeks I'll have a draft and then I want to put it out to the working group and that'll take a week. So I think it's more like three Thursdays, two and a half weeks, three Thursdays. So in three okay. Thursdays, it'll go out to the Board of Ed, it'll go out to Chris. And Lori, if, if, if. Yes, and Lori too. Um, okay, three Thursdays is the 17th of September. Okay. That's, that's the goal. I got it. It's the goal. Okay. Now, all right, that's a few days after our quarterly. We have a quarterly meeting on the 15th. So we could just check on the progress on the 15th. Nothing to read or look at, but we can at least take a, you know, get a, get a temperature check on where we are at on the 15th. Um, so that's that's good. I do I do agree with Lori about, and you and I had talked about this matter of fact today, in regards to bringing people in that are going to have input um, as soon as you feel comfortable but as soon as possible, just to offset any unnecessary changes or uh, conflict. conflict or confusion. Um, at some point, if I'm not sure what your intent on, on utilizing Mr. Santafonte, but our board will definitely utilize Mr. Santafonte in some way to read this policy and go over it before we vote on it, just so you're aware. So if you wanted to bring him in um, at some point, you know, feel free to do so. 
The <laughs> last comment. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. Is and we discussed this briefly. Is the accountability on the policy being followed? So, I don't know if this is a question to you or maybe Mr. Santafonte. Do these policies tend to have any type of whether side policy or comment on accountability and? what the repercussions are if the policy is not followed by a department head? Is that from your job? All right. Either. I think the, any repercussions of not following policy is more of a general HR policy. I don't normally see them built into the specific policy unless it's like a fraud policy or a code of ethics or something like that. That doesn't mean you wouldn't do that, but that generally not following town policy is a, is a general issue versus a specific policy issue. Okay, well, my recommendation would be to have something in writing of consequence if the policies are not followed. Would that be would that follow some sort of protocol? Would that be okay as far as you're concerned, Joe? Yeah, that would be as far as I'm I'm concerned with the, with the penalties. Yeah, putting a penalty in or or, or that type of thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Tom, just something for your committee to you know your working committee to consider because you know we 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 find, we, we all know what happens when policies are not followed. It can cost this town a whole lot of money and it can cost this town a whole lot of grief, the residents grief. And, and of course, when we say res residents, we're talking about the taxpayers. So if we're going to put something together, we might as well add a, a, some type of document, some type of policy um, where it outlines consequences of not following whether 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 it costs us um, fines or money or aggravation or not, and so I I would just suggest that we do have something in place that outlines repercussions for not following what we're all in in, in your group is spending so much time and effort on. Well, as I've spoken to the group, uh, maybe maybe too much, I've been told, is the, the consequences of not following the policy. Because as I've said often, for all the effort we're putting into it, if everybody's going to ignore the policy, then then why, why are you wasting all this time? So I have no problem with what you're suggesting. I guess my, I need to talk to HR a little bit to figure out exactly how we do that. And perhaps that is the HR policy. I don't know. And we refer to that in this document. I'm just not sure. But look, I have no problem with it, and I will uh, uh, I'll talk to HR and see what we can do. But I'd love to have something. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'd like to add something to that before I go to Lori. And that is part of your internal control system is a system of checks and balances. And it's not it's got to be um, administered like through the, throughout the whole town and all the town departments that at each level it should be bounced back if someone doesn't follow the procedures. So if it's a staff person, their manager or whoever approves it for their department should bounce something back to them before it gets too far in the process. And, and there should be different levels of control throughout the entire process at purchasing, at department, at finance, and then finally, you know, the top of administration. And and I think that's part of what Joe looks at when he does his his audit and, and that's how it should work. So it should there should be, you know, it's part of our internal control system. Uh Laurie, did you want to comment further? 
Yes, thank you, Mary. I want to pick up on what you said, but I'm just going to frame it a little bit differently. And, and I'd invite Joe to, to pop in here too, because I think part of what we're talking about, and, and this maybe ties in a little bit of what Jim raised as well, is a monitoring process over our controls. Because when we're talking about internal controls, they're, they're going to be there at a transactional level. So if you spend money, you know, you've got to go out and get a quote if you're spending over $3,000 or whatever we decide the threshold is, right? And that has to happen for each transaction. But there also has to be a monitoring mechanism so that if somebody is out there splitting bids or splitting quotes, there's some kind of reporting that would enable someone else to see that. So, for example, um, you know, maybe part of the policy is that on a monthly basis, you know, someone in finance or, or someone with the appropriate level of authority review uh, expenditures by vendor, you know, so they could see whether, you know, there was evidence that, that there was something like that. But, but the monitoring component is, is separately, separate from those transactional um, controls. And, you know, if we don't have that, you know, we're going to be just you know, the only way you can, can look at it is, is to keep doing audits, which is not the best way to do it, right? There should be a process on top of the controls to monitor that everything looks okay. Um, and that's where I think that, um, you know, and Joe, please jump in here, but, but that's where I think from a best practice perspective that that layer, which is, you know, typically a management review control becomes very important. And, um, you know, and I think that's important to build in. So as, as we think about how, you know, how we do this going forward, you know, it, it, should, it should go beyond just these, just, just the transaction level controls. Um, Joe, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but. No, I mean, I think that was where I think that if you look at the specific issues here is, and, and, and where the control would be is it, probably in purchasing is a lot of the purchases were made and then they tried to fit it into the purchasing policy. So, so that puts a lot of pressure on purchasing. So because not going to prove a PO for something that they shouldn't, but a lot of that was, was, was kind of retrofit in some ways. So there's an opportunity there, but that does put a lot of pressure there. And then also, and then it adds a different layer to accounts payable. And again, it is the same monitoring. If, in one check, you're paying two invoices to the same vendor for 2,900. There's an opportunity to identify that. So maybe some of that monitoring is a training process for people who have the information in front of them at the time they're processing the transaction. Um, thank you, Joe. I agree with that. That I think once this whole purchasing policy is developed that there will be an element of training that needs to be done probably through the entire town and board of ed. Um, any other questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, Chris Swift? <laughs> so, uh, Someone mentioned a, a, a code of conduct, which, you know, if, if, if we don't have that as a municipality right now is a, is a great thing to have because, you know, that could help us put a bow around this in a, in a, in a you know, might be an easier way to keep it. But, um, you know, that might be part of your discussion, Mr. Bremer, with, with HR because, you know, code of conduct, code of ethics, those kind of things. You know, a lot of those type of things that, that I think we're, I know I'm personally worried about are covered under the code of ethics I have to sign for, for my company. So maybe that's a, an avenue for that. Well I, I, well, I know we have a code of conduct and a code of ethics. So, but again, I think that conversation is between, I have to really sit with HR and say, okay. Yeah, absolutely. I want to, I want to put some teeth into this and how, what do I need to do in terms of HR? be able to point to something and say, you know, you didn't follow this policy, there's, 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 there's payment to be made kind of thing. And so, so that's really a discussion I need to have with them, which I'm, I'm more than willing to do. Um, 
the only other comment I'd say on this monitoring and all this other stuff, we have to keep in mind another thing, uh, which is we're kind of butting up against when we're going through uh, our recommendations is, is, wow, who's going to do all this monitoring? Who's going to do this? Um, and we're, we're struggling with that a little bit. Um, because I don't think the, uh, you know, the easy answer is, yeah, let's hire six more people and we'll do all this stuff. Uh, that's an easy answer, but it's not a workable answer. So, so uh, we just have to keep that in mind. I guess that's all I need to say. We just need to keep that in mind in terms of uh, how, we, how we move forward with this. Uh, and I'm hoping that a lot of this is, is handled through units. The, the purchasing policy as we've set it up is, you know, if uh, so-and-so didn't sign off on it, it gets kicked back and that kind of thing. Uh, I'm really focused, when I think of people who are not following the purchasing policy, I'm not really thinking so much, and maybe I should be, but right now we're not thinking so much of the low level and the mid-level. I'm thinking of the higher level people who are doing things they shouldn't be doing. That's really what I'm focusing on because I know, I expect, I suspect and expect that Eunice is taking care of the low level people. I'm more worried what I'm seeing, the more we dig into the DPW, um, for lack of a better word, mess, is there were just a very few people who were in control of an awful lot of money. And, and we need to attack that because, uh, you know, you have one bad person who's in control of a lot of money and it costs you a lot of money. So that's what I'm really focusing on is I don't want to be in a position again where very few people have control over a lot of, a lot of money decisions. That's what I'm trying to get away from. In any department, not just DPW. So this is good. Thank you. This is good. Um, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Joe. Um, are there any other questions or comments from the committee uh, on this topic? No, I just, Lord, if I could just jump in real quick. I just want to again sure. um, thank Tom and again, especially thank you, Tom, for tonight because. In a few minutes, we're going to have the whole Board of Finance meeting, and we're going to go through this same discussion. So I'm going to take I'll, another video today. You could. So I appreciate you <laughs> doing it twice, or if you recorded yourself, that, that might be fine. Okay. Um, okay, I'd like to thank everyone again. And now we're going to move to um, the last item on our agenda, which is um, to hear, consider, and act upon any communications. Um, so just to keep the board in the loop, um, I did sign the engagement letter for the audit and gave it to Joe. Uh, and now we are in receipt of the fraud questionnaire. So that needs to be completed and sent to Joe. So if you're going to complete your own questionnaire, please send it to Joe as soon as possible. And if you could also send a copy to me, um, I'd appreciate it. So I know what we need to discuss. Um, and then last, I'd like to add another meeting to the audit committee schedule. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for December, um, but I don't know what date would be best for that meeting um, yet because it's just, depends on the timeline of when we receive the purchasing policy and the book from um, Mr. Bremer. So it will be either uh, right before our October meeting or right before our November meeting is the dates I have in mind. So I just want to keep that on your calendar. And then if, unless anyone else has any comments, I will take a motion to adjourn. Uh, is this Jim? No. Any other comments? No. Okay, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Jim, anyone to second it? Lori? <laughs> okay, um, all in favor and we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you everyone. And then we'll start our Board of Finance meeting, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>